sure if she had a long enough presentation, but I said I'm sure we had lots of questions and that always takes up a lot of time. And after that, Sandy Everly is going to talk to mm -hmm. us about garlics and bulbs and... Well, just garlics because just garlics. Sage is doing all the other. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. We're getting started late. We had the library flooding this week and um, we had to change our location. So thanks for bearing with us. And with yeah. that, I'll turn it over to Sage. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces out there and a lot of you guys have been to uh, my backyard, which I call my flower farm. And um, I've learned to grow a lot of different things and some of them are bulbs, um, which is what you're here to learn about, um, overwintering bulbs. There are many bulbs that should not be lifted, however. They, in fact, many bulbs need a stratification or a cold period in order to bloom. Tulips, for one, if you live in the south, you can get them pre-chilled and then put them in the ground and then they can get a bloom. But here in Wyoming, we do not have to get pre-chilled bulbs. Um, so tulips, alliums, iris, hyacinths, daffodils, crocus, muscari, I'm sure there's more I've missed. Um, those are all things that you would leave in the ground and many of them will multiply right there and it's awesome and eventually you need to divide them. But we're not talking about that tonight. Um, you have gladiolas, begonias, canna lilies, calla lilies, and dahlias. Um, I say overwintering bulbs because they're not all bulbs. These gladiolas are corms. And I have an example of a corm up here that uh, I did overwinter, but I didn't plant, and so it's dried up and shriveled. But um, if you guys need to see what they look like, it's always nice to have a a show and tell because seeing pictures is not quite the same thing. Um, when you dig up glads, first of all, you gotta be careful. You go, it's best to use like a pitchfork or something like that and dig down and pull up. And then when you pull them off, I snip off the thing and leave about two inches of the stock on there. And you can pull off the corm that gave all the energy to all the blooms will come off. You just pull it off and then you can store the bulb. Um, and, the dorm and they'll have these little cormlets, cormoles on there, and you can save those. But I just, I just leave them on there and say, yeah, live, live and be free. But uh, a lot of people throw them away. Um, and place the corms in a mesh bag and hang in a cool, dry place. I, however, did that, and they looked a little sad. So I would say make sure there's a little more humidity in Wyoming. We can't do what they do in other places because things shrivel. So they were okay and some of them did have life in the spring, but my garage was not a good spot. I would highly recommend a crawl space or a, an area that you have, like your laundry room maybe has a little more humidity or something like that because it was just too dry in my garage. But they don't have to be packed in sawdust or anything. And then you have rhizomes which are your calla lilies and your canna lilies. Um, so here is a calla lily rhizome I dug up today. And you need to let them cure so their skin gets a little bit tough about a week. Here I say three or four days because again, we're dry. And so it doesn't take as long. And I like to store in pet bedding. Today I have an example of some peat moss because that's what I had on hand. But I really like the pet bedding because it's cheap. And in the spring, when you go to pull them out, you're not dusting off all this dirt. It just you know, kind of falls off. It's easier to get off. And so that's what I use. And um, it says, don't let the bulbs touch. And they shouldn't get below 40 or above 60. Or you know, below 40, they'll start to freeze and not do well. Or above 60, they'll start to grow. So um, they always recommend. Uh, checking them monthly to see what's going on because you think they're all fine and you're having Christmas and then your bulbs are down there rotting because you put too much moisture in there or something. And then my favorites are the begonias and the dahlias. So I, I dug up one of my begonias today. These are not the begonias that you get in the six pack at the Walmart. These are tuberous begonias and this is the tuber here and it's that color. It's dark 
And again, these are all pretty much the same. Some people say to wash the tubers. A lot of people I follow on social media do not wash them. Um, and then, like for dahlias, the Dahlia Society says to wrap them in plastic, and I did that last year, and I had great success. Um, the one thing that really made a difference for me when I over the first year I had uh, dahlias, and I overwintered them, they all shriveled up and died. The second year I put them in um, media. I don't remember exactly what I used, and they all rotted because I made it too moist. <laughs> Last year, I got it right, you know, and so I, it was just a little bit of humidity, but it has to be relative to humidity about 75%. Question? How are you adjusting your humidity? Um, so I have that example in here. So right now I have a bunch of peat moss in here, and I just pulled it out of the bag, and then I spritzed it with water. And then I, ha I bought this little thing from Amazon. I think it costs, I got two of them for I think 10 bucks or something. And it has the temperature and a humidity gauge with it. And so right now, if you'll come up and feel this if you want to, you can see that it is, it's still really dry. It's kind of even kind of dusty. But on here it says 99% relative humidity. Now, that's just because I spritzed it about an hour ago. It'll probably decrease a little bit but I thought it would be a great gauge. I have these in my germination chamber and um, that helps me on that, make sure the humidity is high enough because again, we're arid and it, things don't germinate if they're not wet enough. Um, so I'm gonna put one in my bedding this year and so I can gauge how much moisture in there and then I will have better control over shriveling and rot. So, can I uh, ask about the pet bedding? Do you mm -hmm. dampen that also? I do. I just take a squirt bottle and I ch -ch 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 and mix it up and ch -ch 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 and mix it up. And then I, it's just, it's not very wet, but I want some moisture in there. I don't, I don't want to be able to squeeze any water out. It just needs to be a little bit of moisture. Mm -hmm. So if it was too dry um, when you checked it, would you just spritz it a little? It's, yeah, that I would just, sp just spritz it. Because mm -hmm. you can't really mix it up. Well, because you, you got all your stuff in there. But I, you know, if you have to go down deep. So I also, I don't take the, the dirt off of these, but this is my dahlia tubers. And some of them get really big. Some of them can be like this big. And I might cut them in half or cut them in quarters. And I don't worry about the eyes and stuff because I do that in the spring, cut them into. Um, you know, sections to plant, but um, it doesn't hurt to just straight cut them in half or in quarters and then wrap them in cellophane. I got a big roll of uh, plastic wrap from Costco and I roll them up and then stick them in there and I think that was the golden key. So then it doesn't really lose moisture because it's all... Right, wrapped. But I, so again, I still spritz my bedding to keep it cool and moist, just some, just some moisture. Um, so, I mean, ultimately we're trying to mimic a warmer climate, right? So if it was out in a zone seven, you can keep these in the ground in zone seven, they're gonna get rain and some cold and those kinds of things. But, um, so in the bedding, you don't want it to be super dry. I mean, this is basically like a potato. And when you leave a potato out, it starts to shrivel. You need to keep it a little bit moist and so it'll, so it'll survive a little bit longer. I didn't talk about how a lot of people wait till there's a killing freeze and that'll kill off all your foliage. And, but you don't have to. Um, that's just usually when gardeners say, yay, we're done. <laughs> you know, we can have our time back into our lives. Um, but a lot of people do wait for a killing freeze and they say that puts some of the energy back into the, the bulb or, or the tuber. Um, again, check for signs of shriveling um, or rot. I know in dahlias, they have a, a disease called crown uh, gall, or uh, there's another kind of gall. Anyway, and it looks like cauliflower is growing on it. 
or I'll have a, a lot of shoots that you think are going to grow plants, but it won't. And um, if it has that, it's through that, the whole tuber. You can't cut it out. You can't save it. You got to throw it away and get it away. Do not store it with your other tubers. Did I say a question? No. Okay. Um, you see it when you're digging it up? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very apparent. I mean, it, it looks just like this. So it's not something that happens in your storage? It's, when I've pulled stuff out of storage, then I can see it then too. Like maybe it's a bacteria from what I understand. And so if it's in there, um, it may present itself over the winter. But you do not want to store anything. And I think that's another good reason to use the plastic wrap is to protect your other tubers from, it's very common. I would expect, I mean, I grow lots of dahlias, but um, I would expect to have some loss every year from crown gall. But maybe that's just my experience because I grow a lot. So I don't know. Um, and I would assume it's like everything else. You want to disinfect your tools if you do find mm, Yep. Before you continue on yep. cleaning up the rest of them. Yep, yep. Good point. So um, mm -hmm. When you're if it's really large and you're cutting it, are you going to wrap it right away or are you going to let it have some air dry before you wrap it? It, it wouldn't hurt to let it dry. Okay. Yeah. I think, it, yeah, give it some toughness. I didn't do that last year, but it probably would be a wise idea. Um, one tip I got from somebody I follow online from Florette is she uses flag tape. You can get this at the hardware store, and it's great when you're... I like I have diff a lot of different kinds of dahlias and if you want to remember the names of things before you dig it up wrap this around the bottom of the or yeah the bottom of the stock and write the name on it and then you have the name there because you have your little plant ID tag there right and so you just do it right then and then you can throw it into the bin and keep track of your prized tubers. And then when you divide them, and you, you know, like this one was one tuber this spring, and now I have probably have four babies on here. So that's that's awesome, you know. So will you split those then? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's a study out there that says that uh, dahlias that have, you know, like all like a, a big clump of dahlias, will underperform the one that you plant that just has one tuber to it. The younger. So if you divide them, you get more production. So. Don't be afraid to divide them. And if you lose a few, you always lose some when you divide them. But um, you still get more than what, with what you started. And you will get a lot of production out of them. And a lot of people will start tubers in the spring and then take cuttings from them and then expand their crop that way as well. So did I miss anything that you can think of that you had in your presentation? It, you would use just one tuber? Yeah, I just use one tuber. I, I mean, how many did we do this spring, Kim? A million. A million? <laughs> I was giving some away. It was like Christmas. She was unwrapping all of the seven things. Yeah. How do you do your, your cuttings? You uh, just cut, cut the shoot up and then put a few, use growth hormone or you know, something to put them in then put them in water? Like, I put them in some vermiculite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Any questions? Bill. Sorry, I'm curious on that device that you have there. Are you able to give us a brand name and part number? Or oh, this one here? I will look it up on the phone during Sandy's presentation and let you know. Because <laughs> it'll be in my history on Amazon. <laughs> I meant to do that before I came, but... Do you have any like holes drilled in your tub, or is it completely? Mm. That's completely because we're super arid here. If we lived somewhere else, I mean, I've never I, I err on the side of more moisture. And if you see a little bit of rot, it's okay to cut a little bit of rot out, and and just let it go. Just let that part scab, and then like if you're even if when you're digging them up, and it, like you. If you use the shovel, because I've done that before, even if your, your fork gets in there and it slices it, just cut the bottom part off and let it scab over and it'll probably produce. What you need on a dahlia anyway, I know more about dahlias than anything, is that you need a little part of the neck 
and the tuber and an eye and that's it. So even if like, like most people, they just cut these parts off. They don't even worry about these roots. They just cut these parts off. Yep. And, but so all you need is just a little bit of the tuber and there'll be an eye, just a little white pimple on there and then a piece of the tuber. If you do have any um, bulbs that are shriveled a little bit, are not like, they don't look completely dead. They're probably viable. They are. How would you revive them? What would be the best? So if what I would do if I was worried about it, I didn't want to use a, a good garden space, is put it in a pot. And um, I try to pre-sprout all my dahlias because I just never know for sure what's going to you know, really do well. And um, so if it starts doing some growth, then you're like, score, and then you can transplant it. So when do you do that? When do you pull them out and start that? May. The ground's not warm enough before June, so if you give it a couple weeks, like four weeks, you know. I, sometimes I'm really late because I get so busy. <laughs> so it's not always ideal when I get it done, but yeah, I try to do the beginning of May. If I do a cuttings, I do a lot earlier, of course. So on some of the tubers that you thought were no good, mm -hmm. um, I took them and threw them in the dirt and they didn't grow. And I thought, okay, they were no good. Well, within the last three weeks, they have been growing like great guns, and I've got all of these beautiful blossoms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear a lot of stories on my like, podcast yeah, and stuff. I listen to like, oh, the compost is growing some dahlias. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so they've got more energy in them than you think. So. So the one that has the five babies on it, are you going to split that now and wrap those individually and put those in, or do you do that next spring? I'm going to do that next spring. That's just because of the busyness of the fall. And in the spring, I have more time. A lot of people will divide them through throughout the winter. They'll pull them out and divide them up and then stick them back in storage if they have, you know, spare time. So, um, and a lot of the flower farmers, because I follow flower farmers, of course, um, they sell the tubers. And they'll, they'll sell a tuber. The average price this last year was six ninety five for a little tuber. So, um, but if you've got a good one that produces a lot of flowers and they're good for cutting, they, they can get it, so. Is there a particular variety for us newbies that you would recommend? No. Or just, just yeah, more? I mean it really, uh, dahlias are so diverse and it depends on your palate. So I went out when I was preparing today and I just cut a bunch of dahlias that were in the garden and you can see how varied they are. I mean, we've got some dinner plates in here, this big white one, and then you got a little ball one, and a cactusy one, and all different colors. And usually their colors are so vibrant, that's what makes them fun. The vase life is not stellar. It's about five days, if, if it's that. But the bigger the dahlia, the shorter the vase life. So the, da the dinner plates, a lot of people use those for wedding work. So it only has to last a day. It might last two. But um, it's glorious while it lasts, right? <laughs> so, I, so I don't have a recommendation. I mean, there's, there's just so many beautiful ones. And have you guys ever been to Swan Island's website? They're like, I've been there, and it's, they have an amazing fields out in Oregon. And so I would recommend them as a, a dealer. Swan Island dahlias. I haven't. I haven't. I might this year because I have quite a bit and I want to, I want more varieties. <laughs> we always want more, right? Uh-huh. So do you take all of yours up then? Mm-hmm. Um, so then how many years, I guess, do they last? Like how many times do you do them? Forever? Forever. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good investment time, you know? Yeah, it is. Especially if you have an outlet to sell, you know, and, but they're time consuming. So, I mean, you got to plant them every f spring and then you got to dig them up every fall. And question? Ellen, the first question, do you keep a, a map or do you just track where they um, were based on what you knew was there? I feel like I would forget. Yeah, there's some that I, 
you know, the tags fell off of, or they, you know, something happened, I don't know where they are. And sometimes I just put a smiley face, I liked this one. <laughs> and so I want to keep you, and it might be, I'll be smiley face purple, <laughs> you know. But then there's other ones that I, like, didn't bloom real well, or there's one that I have, it's called Vancouver, it's a real pretty purple and white. But a lot of them, the white gets really muddy looking. And I'm like, you're just not pretty because you look like you're old, even though you're not old because of that darkness in there. I'm not going to grow you next year. So yeah, so then I cull those and throw them in the compost pile. <laughs> so what do you feed them? A lot of fish emulsion. And you know, every week I try to spray them with some fish emulsion. Some what? Fish emulsion, um, like Neptune's Harvest is one brand, and Alaska, what's that called? Anyway, yeah, because it has it's a lot of nitrogen. And then when they start flowering, I try to give them a little more phosphorus. So how big of a space, are, how big of a space? For Adelia? Yeah, if, you know, you say you like lots of them, and so I'm assuming you have a lot of space, but if I was planting them in my small yard, how much space should I give? It depends on, of course, the dahlia. There's some, I mean, some of mine in my hoop house now are taller than me, um, but there's other ones that I have in my pots that are just little tiny ones that are only this, you know, like a little, like a foot tall. So, um, but out in my fields for, you know, those ones, 12 to 18 inches apart, because that way they support each other and you don't have to do so much crowling with them. Um, a lot of staking. I'm, one thing I'm going to try next year is trying to plant my tubers deeper so they don't fall over so easily. So I'm going to try that. We'll see. And how um, deep do you plant them? I'm going to try to plant them six inches deep this year, this next year. I think I did more like four and then I had quite a few fall over and I didn't stake them as soon as I should have, <laughs> honestly. but. They do get really top heavy, and their their stems are hollow, and so they 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 break. So. Do you rotate your crops at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do mm -hmm. you plant them in the same year, like a couple of times, or do you just rotate? I try to rotate everything every year. It doesn't work perfectly, but yeah, the shade areas are kind of hard to rotate, <laughs> but. Yeah, I try to rotate everything. It's just safe practice. Not everything needs that, but I try. So what are you, what do you have planted with your dahlias? I mean, what else do you have in your garden? A lot. <laughs> I mean, I have zinnias and cosmos and ageratum and celosia and Bells of, Bells of Ireland, Sweet William. Uh, I have some decorative type basils to put in, um, and some grasses, and some broom corn, and what else do I have, Kim? Sunflower Go through the lots of sunflowers. I've had 100 sunflowers a week in the spring. Um, uh, so do you put a certain crop next to your dahlias to help support them, so it's a little shorter? No, because they're pretty hungry, okay. and they're very thirsty. That you can almost not overwater a dahlia. But when you first plant them, you give them no water at all. I mean, you moisten the ground and don't water them all because it, it can rot it. And as soon as it, but as soon as you see some green growth, then you start watering it. And when they are flowering, you flood them. <laughs> so. But you should grow begonias. Do any of you guys grow begonias? These are my faves on my deck. You, do you grow them in pots? I grow them in pots. Oh. Mm -hmm. And th this is a hanging one because it bends over and... Mm. What and colors do you have? Will you split that then or keep that? No, I think it's just, just one. I, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't reproduced for me, pro propagated. Have you, do you know how to propagate them? I haven't done it though. I have seen a program where they um, cut them just like they did with the um, dahlias oh. and then rooted them in, you know, vermiculite or perlite or whatever. Hmm. They cut the tuber though and did it that no, way. No, no, just the stem. 
oh, this, this, so they, they took a cutting from it. So yeah, I don't know. I, had, I, I was interested to see if this had a baby on it, but it didn't. So I was sad. Would it be like, a, like sometimes if you slice a tulip, whatever little chunk you have off to the side it grows? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't I, tulips will put another little bubblet on the side, so I don't know. I know, I know when we dug up our tulips, if we cut one in half, and mm -hmm. you know, we thought we got them all out, those little chips in there will start growing again. Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah. So, all right, I'll look up this little thing. If you guys want to come up and see how dry this is, and you can see right now the humidity in here is 49%, but I'll put this back in here and I'll climb right back up. So you don't dust yours with the insecticide? Mm-mm. I never have either, but I know they say Mm-mm. Mm-mm. That was one of the reasons, though. I, I did dust my glads last year because they had thrips so bad, and that's one of the reasons I didn't plant these is because they were like a thrips magnet, and I just... I didn't have a good area for them. I didn't want to get thrips next to the area I did have for them. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to plant these this year. And it was getting late because June was so cold this year. I thought, this is not going to have enough time to really bloom properly. So I just kind of threw them away. But I found them out in my compost pile. <laughs> so any more questions? Mm -mm. I don't do anything. Do you? Do, I don't. Well, you want to make sure that you trim those leaves part way down. Yeah. Oh, really? I've never done yeah. that. I just yeah, let them go. Trim, trim the leaves in you know, four inches. Mm -hmm. but, but I wait till um, it's pretty much died back because I want all the energy the sun can give through those leaves, but then I can trim them. So do you yeah. wait till after, like, the first frost? No, it, um, well, it might be this year. Because usually by now mine have wilted over, but they still look, you know, like they have all summer. So I'll probably wait till the first frost. But sometimes our weather fluctuates so much in September, they start to kind of brown all up on the tips back, and then I just yeah. Irises are pretty hardy. Well, it depends on the variety, I guess, but yeah. they're pretty hardy that you can kind of abuse them. Yeah, and if your irises aren't blooming, you probably have them buried too deep. And so then you just need to lift them in a half in the soil and half on top. So, so have you ever tried uh, overwintering any of your other crops? I'm, just, I'm trying to dig out a bed before winter, like maybe some peonies or a hardy geranium. I think they'd make it. So geraniums, yes. Peonies, peonies do not like to be moved. I know. I you can't, you cannot, you know, they take about three years to establish to really start getting good flowers on them. So hold them spring. You, you, you just, I do try to cover up my, my peonies and give them some extra protection. But they do die back, but I still cover them up. Do you trim them back? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this year I'm going to do the worm castings on them because I, yeah, worm castings on them. Is Question. it better to move peonies in the spring if you have to move them? Or the fall or does it matter? Uh, fall is better because they're a spring bloomer, but um, they don't like to be moved. <laughs> and if you can go really big around there so you're not disturbing it so much so then you know you can do a, a whole clump and then like if you're just moving it in your yard but if you're like moving it to a different house I may not be yeah my mom recently died and oh. so I need to like move mm. all her stuff and yeah so that may not be pop it's too late now. no no oh no it's perfect falls better falls better okay. I is that right On the begonias again, because you don't divide those, you can't cut it. So basically, then each year the bulb just gets bigger and produces more flowers or bigger flowers or what? I I don't know. Oh okay. <laughs> yeah, I've never cut 
I, I have I, I, this is this is this is my second year with this uh -huh. particular one and it looks the same it doesn't look any bigger to me but you know so what are you going to do with that now I'm, I'm going to let it die back a little bit and then I'll cut it off and then I'll stick it in some bedding and put it in my laundry room they say uh, last year I did not put it in bedding but it didn't look as good as I wanted it to it looked a little bit dry so I'm going to put it in bedding this year like I do my dahlias. You wrapped them in plastic too? I didn't wrap these in plastic because when I did the Google search, it said I didn't need to. But, um, you know, I just get bit all the time with us being so arid that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in bedding. Mm -hmm. So when you say the plant bedding, are you talking about the stuff that looks like sawdust? Because mm -hmm. I tried using like the redwood looking mm -hmm. chips and mm -hmm. that did not work. What did you do? I mean, I just did, put them in it, but I didn't miss them. So you didn't miss it, yeah. So I missed it, mine, and um, and then I wrapped them in the plastic, and that was. But it was just a miss. I'm like I, later, you guys should come up. This is reading 85 percent humidity in here now, mm -hmm. and it's still kind of dusty. It's not wet, so it doesn't take much. I'll, I'll pack that around. Okay. <laughs> That's peat moss. I thought I had pet bedding out in the in the shed, and I, it was peat moss. So I. But I'm gonna try this year. Other ones are not work out very good. Have you tried um, vermiculite or perlite? No. Um, I tried that with. I think I did try that with a few dahlias my first year, and that it was just it it, it was expensive, and so. And then when I have, you know, I have probably five totes. Okay. You know, this yeah. gets to be a lot. Yeah. So, so that's why I did the pet bedding. I I don't have a crawl space, so I go over to my parents and store them in my parents' crawl space. Because oh, okay. <laughs> because I have so much to store, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Sage? Did everybody get a um, ticket to put in? Okay. I did. So since these are sages, I'll let you reach in All right. and pull out. All right. There's the wiener. Oh, you wrote them on. Wrote them. Sherry? I would say Sherry. Sherry. With the, the number. Oh. <laughs> zero four eight of the last three digits. Four five seven zero four eight. Woo! <laughs> Should you just leave them in there until but you don't get the picture, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there anything she needs to know? I see you've got a packet on a, a fire food, yeah. Just okay. keep them out of the sun. Floor is yours, Sandy. And Sandy Everly is one of our master gardeners, and you guys have probably seen other subjects that she's done. And just to remind you that Mandy is recording this, and it will be available on our website. All of our classes are on our website. So if you missed it tonight or you know somebody that missed it, you can tell them to look on there. And you can leave your surveys by the water when you guys are walking out. So Thank you. OK. so. Um, as Diane said, I'm Sandy Aberly. I've been a master gardener for like 15 years, something like that, somewhere around in there. And um, I got asked if I would talk about garlic. Well, garlic is one of those things that I told Mandy I could talk for two hours. And I had to keep changing my slides. It was like, no, I don't have to tell them that. It's only about the stuff in the fall. And <laughs> so um, up along the table, I have about 10 different types of garlic. Um, and so we're going to talk about those. I have some garlic honey with some toothpicks. I'm going to let you try that later. And I also have, if you're a drinker, you'll probably like this. <laughs> I am making garlic vodka. Now, I am not a drinker, so why would I do that? I'm actually doing this for medicinal reasons. It's good for your stomach, your intestines, actually your overall health. 
If you're a drinker, it's, you can put it in a Bloody Mary. You could make a martini with it. <laughs> but they've literally been using this for thousands, about nine, 900 to 1,000 years. Natural antibiotic, isn't it? It is. And so you shake it every single day for 21 days, and it gets cloudier and cloudier. And then I'll just strain it. And so it'll be one of those things you take about 15 drops two times a day, and every time you'll go, <gasps> because it's really, you know, it's not only the liquor, it's the garlic, and it gets more powerful and more powerful, but it's really good for you. So. How many garlic did you put in there? Um, I just used a bunch of little ones. There was probably eight small garlics, cloves, not the bulbs, but the, just the individual cloves. Um, if you were going to do a large, regular size garlic, I'd probably do six and just chop them all up. But um, I do keep a cloth around it so it stays dark. And one of the things about garlic, it has sulfur in it. So if those little pieces started getting like blue-green on them, there is nothing wrong with that. It's just the sulfur in the garlic. Um, sometimes people will pickle garlic and they'll see that greenish tone or that bluish tone. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the sulfur in those. And some garlics are more powerful than others. So, and that's what makes them hotter. And some garlics are mild. It's just the amount of the sulfur compound in there. So what's your liquid in there? Vodka. So it, it is vodka. Yeah, and you can yeah. use just cheap vodka. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, I suppose you could buy expensive got but I think this one this bottle cost me like six dollars I guess that's not very much you know I don't know 21 days so what I do is I put the date when I started it and the date when I it's supposed to be done so I don't ever have to look it up again so um, forever yeah yeah the any alcohol is a natural preservative and you're going to strain those pieces of garlic out and so all you will have is the flavor in there and the all the good things that it's literally sucked out of the garlic how long is the period of time that you write on the bottle 21 days now online you might find some people that tell you 10 days but i don't think that's enough it, it's basically making a tincture, and so you need to be able to have enough time for it to pull everything out of the garlic. Okay, so we are talking about planting garlic in the fall. And then specifically, you grow garlic differently in the north than you do in the south. Here, we either grow hard neck or soft neck. But if you're planting in the fall, the only one you can grow is a hard neck. If you want to grow soft neck garlic, which is totally okay, you plant that in the fall or in the springtime. Because it a lot of it, if we have a bad winter, it won't survive and it'll it'll never come up. It'll just rot in the ground. So you just remember hard neck in the fall, soft neck in the in the springtime. Now in the allium group, because the garlic is an allium, the only thing that outsells them in the world are onions. So it is a huge crop. There's a huge market. Um, I don't usually suggest people ever buying garlic from a store if it says it's from China, because they actually bleach that. Um, and so it's just something that you know, buy it from California in the store, um, Florida sells them, but don't buy it from China because they have some um, videos that actually show them bleaching them and I don't want bleach in my food. <laughs> so I just don't do that. Um, all garlic came from wild garlic and it was, it developed into a hard neck garlic. From the hard neck garlic, they, um, I guess, bread it to make soft neck garlic. Now, you might say, what's the difference? This is basically the difference. When you have soft neck garlic, it has the leaves that come up, but it doesn't make this hard stem, this scape. 
And that's an easy way to tell if you're in the grocery store and you go, I don't know if this is soft neck or if this is hard neck, because what if you wanted to buy some at the store and plant it? Because it's way cheaper that way. Um, <laughs> but um, you, if it has that center stem in there, even if it's cut way down here, you know it's hard neck. Because soft neck, and I'll, I'll pass these around. This is a soft neck from Colorado, but it will bend over. That, that little stem in there will bend over where this cannot bend over. And both of these came from Colorado. Um, the one with the scape on there still, I got at a farmer's market. The other one I got at an organic co-op store. They're both fabulous garlics. So it's not a right or wrong, but this is the fall, and we're talking about fall bulbs, so we're just gonna talk about hard neck garlic today. And they're just divided into different categories. Now the reason I put hard neck or soft neck, and I didn't say anything about elephant garlic, because you buy elephant garlic in the store, it's huge, it looks beautiful. It's not a garlic, it's actually a leek. But it tastes like a garlic, but it's just, it's just not. Um, if you wanted to grow those, you need to grow them in the springtime too, because our winters are too cold. Our soils freeze too hard. And so it's just something to remember. Um, I like growing elephant garlic, but you just don't do it now. Now, how do you plant your, the garlic? Um, sometimes you order garlic online and it can actually have diseases hidden in between the cloves and the producer did not know that. Um, especially if they're a small producer. Um, most large producers from certain um, states like California, they have to test for those different bacterias and viruses, and so they can't ship them out without have the, having it already tested. But there's a way to get around that. So we're, we're just gonna take a clove, and I'm just gonna break this. So these are individual cloves, right? And that's where that bacteria and diseases hide, in between them. So an easy way to do this is just get yourself a bucket or a bowl and put hydrogen peroxide in it and just leave them in there for about five minutes. Uh, apart like yeah, broken apart. Now you can use other things. There's different um, um, things that will I guess um, disinfect it that you can buy, you know, that's for the garden, but hydrogen peroxide will just work. Just straight out of the bottle? Just straight out of the bottle, five minutes, okay? So then you can just. Do you soak them or you just. You're just gonna put them in there, just put all of them that you've broken apart into that bowl and just let them soak in there. Just move it around a little bit and um, so that they're all getting all the different sides. And you're not peeling them. You're not peeling them. Okay. Um, these papers that it makes around there are actually in conjunction with every leaf that was on the garlic. Hmm. So if it comes up and you have eight leaves, you basically have eight skinny, tiny um, layers hmm. around your clove. When you pull it out of the ground, a lot of times you might lose a, a layer or two but it's important to keep that intact as long as you can. It makes it store better if you're gonna eat that later. And so the more you can keep that intact, the better it will be. And it'll last months versus a few weeks. Um, Do you disinfect yours every year that you're growing or just the ones that you buy? No, I think you should do it every year, no matter if you bought them or if you grew them. Because you just don't know what might harbored into the soil because sometimes because you can grow these for two years and then you have to move them so and you don't move them where onions have ever been so that's just a little trick because sometimes onions can harbor those um, viruses and bacteria and it didn't do anything to the onions but when you plant your garlic it can do stuff to you and you can end up having disease and rot and all kinds of stuff so you just don't plant them where your onions were 
So how long should you wait between onions? I mean, what I'm saying is, don't plant them one year where onions were, two years where onions were? Like, well, um, there are some people that say you should never plant them, okay. you know, but I would wait at least a couple years, okay. you know, because then if there's things in your soil, you should probably have found that out. So when you um, put the cloves in the peroxide, do you rinse them off after that or no? No, no, because I'll show you what we're going to do after okay. that. So if you're planting the hard stuff. Mm -hmm, hard neck. Okay, so then you dig them up every year? You do. If you left them in the ground, what it's going to do is that one clove is going to, or the one bulb, each of those cloves are going to try to make um, cloves too and so you, pretty soon you have all these garlic coming up. Okay. Um, in the fall time just pull that whole clump up and divide them out even though that they'll be smaller because it's a big clump mm -hmm. and use some of them. I always like to plant my largest um, cloves possible mm -hmm. but it, you can use all those little ones. And then you can put them back in the ground in the fall. You can okay. yeah. When you pull them up you always want them to cure. And so um, I used to hang them on my clothesline. I would just take the plants and I hang them on my clothesline. But I did a lot of research and it's not just curing it. When you're, I'm doing that, I'm actually um, drying them out. And so that wasn't a good thing. So now I put them in the shed or in the basement and I just let them cure for a couple weeks. And then I can go plant them again. You could let them cure for a month, two months. If you, if you dug them up at the end of July, you don't want to plant them until in September. So um, they'll stay hard and, you know. And that's the easy way to tell. If this feels mushy at all, you don't want to plant it. You won't have a good, if it even survives the winter, you won't have a good garlic. Okay? Do you keep a permanent garlic bed? No. Yeah, every couple of years you should. Just because um, there can be viruses and bacteria that get into the soils and, um, you know, you might be able to stretch it three years, but then you should move them. So what a, a lot of garlic growers, you know, they have acres and acres. And so they have their five foot row and then they have five feet that is just a walkway. And then they have a five foot row. And so after those couple years or three years, if they stretch it, then that walkway becomes where they plant. And so then they can go back and forth, still using the same acreage, but um, they're still rotating them. Um, I left mine in the soil too long this year, and when you go to pull them up, the cloves have already divided and they are a little dry. Are they still plantable? Um, they're not mushy, they're just dry. No, they're not mushy, they're, but you can, mm. when you pull it up, you look down the hard, the stem, and they've all pulled away from the stem, and mm -hmm. they're separate, they're still together, but. Yeah, they're still okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you just don't want um, any mushy ones. Okay. If, um, if you have, say you have a lot of garlic that year, you can throw these in the freezer, and then just use them in soups and whatever you want to cook them in so that you're not wasting them. But the longer it stays in there, the more the cloves go like this. And sometimes when you go to pull it, the scape will break. And so um, it's kind of a fine line. You just have to kind of keep, keep watching. And an easy way to tell is um, your garlic's on the outside. If you, when it starts to get there, um, you have six leaves left, but everything else is browned. That's usually about the perfect time. And if you wait longer than that, more and more of it dries out, and then it's easier, the scape will break, or um, they start to spread apart. So if you try those outside ones, that kind of gives you an idea when that to do. Hard to plant. Um, well, we're going to come to that. Okay. okay. No, that's okay. Um, I like to plant them actually anywhere from five, in five inches to eight inches. Um, garlic roots, if you've ever grown them, um, they like to move, spread out. And the more that they get that roots, because you have to kind of think of garlics as a grass. And so you want to make sure that 
they're getting a lot of nitrogen. It's going to really help with it growing, the bulb growing, and the roots growing. So, now what am I going to do after I disinfect them? Now, this is a new thing for me. I've done tons of research on this. I usually just disinfect them and it's going back into the ground, right? But there's a lot of studies and a lot of garlic growers in California um, and, and in Oregon that get a five gallon bucket, they've disinfected them, and they're using either seaweed emulsion, um, liquid fertilizer, or fish emulsion, liquid fertilizer. And they're gonna just pop all of them in there and it starts to absorb it and you can leave that in there up to 24 hours. Um, the one guy in Oregon that I was reading his book, this book, it's really good. Can you you tell us what it is? No, mm -mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's Growing Great Garlic and it's by Ron England. I have read this and read this and read this book. It's really good. And he says that sometimes they get busy and those garlic are sitting in that bucket for three days. And he says it hasn't made any difference at all. So he says sometimes they'll pull them out and they've already started to root. So, <laughs> but um, like tonight when I get home, I'll pull all these apart. I'm gonna disinfect them, I'm gonna soak them, and then tomorrow afternoon I'm planting all my garlic. So, all of these? All of those, yeah. What I'd really like is a piece of land that I could have half an acre and grow garlic. On an actual acre of garlic, if you have fertile land, you can do about four to five tons of garlic. That's a good um, crop. <laughs> and so we've disinfected it. We're putting in the liquid fertilizer. Um, so we live in Wyoming. This makes a difference on when we plant garlic. I like to plant the garlic between September 15th and about the 30th of September. Now, it looks like we are gonna have nice weather, which is good, because you wanna figure before the ground freezes solid, not when we have a snow in September and then it gets warm again. Um, when it freezes solid, you want four to six weeks for your garlic to start to grow. You want it to start to have some of the, that root system. And so that's why if you plant in the middle of September, towards the end of September, it's perfect time. The soil is still warm, even if we got snow on it, um, because that melts right away. You know, we have those snowstorms, and two days later it's 80 degrees. So we're gonna plant them. I like to do three to four inches deep. Now, almost every place you will read, they're telling you to plant your garlic one inch deep one and a half inch deep. But they don't have our soils. They don't have that freezing and thawing, that heaving up. And if you don't do it three or four inches deep, you go out in the middle of the winter and your garlic is sticking out of the ground because it's, it's frozen, it's unthawed, and it's heaved up just like it does with how it brings rocks up to the surface. It's gonna do that with your garlic. And just like dahlias and begonias, if you do it deeper, that stem is stronger. So um, that's what I like to do. Um, I like to mark out where my garlic is going. So, because I have a lot of different kinds of garlic. And so just those tongue depressor things, um, you can write that or whatever you're gonna use for your markers. And um, so I plant my garlic in that row three to four inches deep, and then side dress it with worm castings and compost. And all winter long, the snow will land on top, it'll melt, it'll give that nutrients down into your soil. Now, because we live in Wyoming, I think after you have that compost and the worm castings on, you should put about four inches of straw down. You could use spent wheat, um, any kind of mulch-like thing. And then if you can lay boards or a hog panel or something to hold the straw down, because otherwise in the middle of winter you're gonna lose all your straw from the wind. But it kind of insulates it. And the whole idea is 
you would like to slow down the process of it freezing around that clove. So the slower you can make it um, freeze solid around there, the bigger garlic you're gonna have the next year. Oh, okay, so here is your row that you have all your garlic planted. Side dressing is putting the compost and the worm castings on either side, but not right on top, okay? And that's just side dressing. Do you mix them or do you have one? Um, well, one and my theory is you put the worm castings down mm -hmm. and then you put the compost on top. Okay. Um, I do that around trees that, that way. Um, I just think it um, helps your soil and it's really gonna get a lot of nutrients, but it's slowly gonna percolate down into it. And so that's what I like to do. Um, we put the mulch on. Um, and this is what I talked about before. If you had a fertile soil, now, do we have an acre of fertile soil in Wyoming? <laughs> I think you'd have to work on that. <laughs> Which is a nice thing about garlic is that if you decide that you want to do this great big plot of garlic, sell garlic at the farmer's market, you start in the spring and you have all that time to add good stuff to your soil. Mix it in and adding things and then you plant it in the fall. So that the next end of July, first part of August, depending on how our weather is that year, um, then you're harvesting garlic. You always want to take your largest cloves and replant those. And then you either use, sell, um, give to your friends all the rest of your garlic. Okay. Now, I have three books up here. Um, my one, that's my favorite one. Um, this one is just on, has a lot of recipes and beverages and all kinds of stuff that you can make with garlic. Um, if you were just starting out with garlic, oh, I think it's in this one. Can you tell us what that book is? Nope. Um, <laughs> Basic Flavoring Garlic, and it's by Claire Gordon Smith. Um, but it just has interesting ideas on how to use garlic that you might not have thought about. Um, this one. Um, is Garlic the Edible Biography, and is by Robin Cherry. But if you were only going to make one thing with garlic, I think you should make this. And this is called Mortem. And Virgil, the poet, hundreds of years ago, wrote about this dish. And it has garlic, celery stalks, cilantro, lovage, or lovage, depending on how you pronounce it, um, feta cheese, olive oil, and white wine vinegar. It is like amazing. So, um, Mandy can probably get copies of this if anybody wants that. But, um, no, it's just like you mix it all together, it's like a dip, yeah. Um, but it's because you're pounding it or using the food processor in it, but all those flavors together are just like, and if you don't know what lovage is, lovage, how do you pronounce it? Lovage. Lovage, that's how I do it too. Um, it is a celery um, flavor, basically. And you take the young um, stalks or the, the leaves and you can chop it up, it's very powerful. But um, it just gives it this really cool, um, and I, I just like it that, you know, Hundreds of years ago, they were talking about it. Virgil wrote a poem about it. And so um, I just think it's fabulous. But um, this is a really good book, too. It has a lot of recipes and things that you can do with garlic. And she has a lot of history on um, politics and history that are all affected by garlic. And so it's a real interesting book. And maybe the library has it. I'm not really sure. Um, garlic, the Edible Biography. And it's by Robin Cherry. Okay, um, I do have toothpicks so everybody can try some garlic honey. My husband puts it basically on everything. Um, he, he likes it on his eggs in the morning. The other day he had these Dorito chips and he's 
putting it on there and he's going, do you want some? And I said, no. <laughs> um, it didn't make any sense to me, you know? But I made it for him to make him take a tablespoon a day because it's really good for you. Honey and garlic are both very healthy for you. It's an easy way to get it. Um, but now he puts it on everything. So, so I guess he probably gets more than that a day. So <laughs> I should be happy. But there's toothpicks. Um, don't double dip, just get another toothpick. And um, you can come up and look at any of these different kinds of garlic. I have um, from purple garlics, like Russian garlics, Siberian garlics. Um, I have some um, soft neck garlics. If you wanna break apart a soft neck garlic all the way, so that you can just see the differences. Even though it has a little bit of this, it's all, it's not hard, it's all mushy in the center. And so if you're at the store and you just break the garlic apart. <laughs> what do, what do you, uh, all the different garlics, what are the, the characteristics that makes you grow so many? Um, some of them are much hotter than other ones. Like, I like garlic that's hotter, very... Does that mean stronger? Stronger, garlic? yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, hotter is not probably a good word. Stronger. Okay. Um, and then when you go to buy garlic online, it will ask you, do you want to buy gourmet or small garlic? And that would be just garlic that you're going to cook with. Then there's medium, large, and jumbo. And the larger they get, the more expensive they are. But sometimes, especially if you want to be restocking that added expense is I think worth it you know like I have been growing um, Russian garlic here in Gillette easily for over 15 years and um, I mean I did buy those new ones those new cloves though I have some at my house um, but in 15 years I had never bought garlic again I had just replanted Well, <laughs> well it, it is expensive. Well, like a lot of times, like this Siberian garlic, um, I think I got a half a pound and it was $14. Um, like, if I can afford it that year, I would rather buy jumbo. So I got some new garlic. And this is the jumbo, and this is, nope, let me take it back. This is the large. So it's not a lot of difference. Um, most garlics, the larger they get, a lot of times they only have four cloves in there, um, where some of them will have eight, up to eight. So it's just different varieties have different ones. I happen to like purple ones, even though when you take the skin off, it's still white inside. <laughs> it's just one of those things that I like. And so, um, but this was a new one. I just bought it, this jumbo. And I think this one cost me $18. But if I look at it, that it's gonna be something that I'm gonna re redo and replant in. Um, now, if you're storing your own garlic, you should cut it about this much, about an inch, inch and a half. But really, you should have your roots a little teeny bit longer than this. Um, you do want to trim them. Um, when you first pull them out and they're going to cure, you're going to just kind of brush the dirt off. Don't scrub it or anything. Don't put it in water. Because the whole idea is that you are curing it. And the idea of throwing it in water doesn't make any sense because that would get um, yeah, it would get soft. It would get stuff in between your cloves, so you don't want to do that. I think uh, Sage's idea of getting that tape and putting it on your garlic before you harvest it, before you dig mm -hmm. it, so you know which kind you have when you right. save it and use it. Because yeah, because you have your rows marked, but then when you're pulling it all out and you're yeah, curing that, it could easily. I mean, there are a lot of garlic people will take um, mesh wire that is. Um, an inch to two inches in diameter, and they make a wooden table, and they put their garlic through, and so the, the green part is hanging down like here, and that's how they cure them. And you want it about 75% humidity, if that's possible, 
and you never want the temperature to go over about 70, 75. If, you're, if you can get it 55 to 65, you're better. So a, a cool basement, a cross basement, things like that will really help. How long do you cure it before you? Well, it really, it can vary. The smaller the clove, in, clove is, the less time it's gonna take, but. But how would you tell, I mean? Well, the paper feels a little bit different. It gets a little drier, but at least um, probably two weeks. Um, if you have way more humidity, it's going to take longer. And so you, you have to kind of just kind of gauge it by the feel of it. You don't want things to rot. You don't want to put all your garlic in a bowl in your pantry, and then all of a sudden it's starting to get soft and yucky. And, and the drier it gets, the more the dirt will just brush right off. Um, I I think I would probably try growing hardneck in the garden in there. So when I pulled it out at the end of July, the first part of August, I would put it in my free refrigerator first for a couple weeks, and I put it in my freezer and make it think it has gone through winter. But um, if you're going to try to do it right now, you could try soft neck. It just might still be too cold, even if it doesn't freeze in there. And you might not have really any growth until um, April, which might be okay. If you were storing these in a cool place, um, on average, how long do they store? Well, different garlics will store different amounts. And so who you're buying it from will tell you. Now, most garlics, if it's cured properly and the temperature is cool, uh, I've had garlic five, six months. You know, um, sometimes even longer than that. Um, it just depends on the amount of humidity in your the room and stuff like that. But it will usually tell you because certain garlics will last their best three months. But most of them, and soft necks will actually last longer than a hard neck, which is weird to me because I would think it would be the other way around, um, where they can last you know seven eight months sometimes if it's stored properly. I was going to say one thing, maybe it's the one in the book. The first year I did this for the hard man, I ordered it from Nexia. And thinking, you know, Amazon will have here in 24 hours. Or my money back. No, it came from Russia. I mean, the season had almost come and gone, and it shipped from there. So you got to have it, like, now, right? You do. Yeah. Yeah. But there are some places... Um, right now that you can still order it. And like these ones that I just ordered in, um, I ordered it and I bet you I had them in four days. And so, and it tells you, you know, how much you're paying for your shipping. If you'd like it in two days, how much it, more it is to get it shipped to you. But um, this was four days and I didn't pay the extra. And so I thought, I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, you know, I order mine when I order my spring seeds. Uh -huh. And I just got mine shipped. I got it today. Uh -huh. So it goes on the original order, but they don't ship it right. until it's time. So yeah. you can do that also. Yeah, because most of them will ask you um, what zone or what your zip code is way before you put your address in. And they'll tell you we're shipping these areas on this this week and you know this week, and so you kind of have an idea of what when to expect it, and you hope we're not having a blizzard when it gets <laughs> to your house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. One time, um, next to my greenhouse, I had all these extra garlics, and I thought there is no way we are eating all of these garlics. And it had gotten nice; the soil was not frozen on that top part, and it had to have been January or February. And I still planted them, but they were, like Jody said, not as big, but they still made cloves. Um, in my backyard, at one point in time, I planted garlic, and I didn't cut the flowers off. Oh, the scape. The scape. And um, you get little itty bitty garlics and 
It's been 10 years and I'm still trying to remove garlic from my yard. And, so <laughs> and if I pull it and it's too dry, they do come up in the same space, but, mm -hmm. but they are tiny. I mean, yeah. they're not, but they're still usable and they still right. taste okay. But if you don't cut the flower off and it goes to seed, be prepared to have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what they're talking about is escape on a hard neck, and that is the stem that comes up on a hard neck and in the summer it'll spin around like this and it makes little boblets and so that's when usually people cut them and then they chop those up and they do them in stir fry you can make pesto out of it you can do all kinds of stuff it's very nice garlic flavor but if you let it it will uncurl itself and it will make the little boblet <laughs> and the little because it has just like hundreds of little teeny boblets and some of them are very prolific some of them are more sterile, depending on the type of garlic that you have. And, but you can get them all over your yard then. Over, yeah. yeah. I have in my front yard, my backyard, my side yard, <laughs> you know, where they just kind of blow and go. So vampires so are too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who said yeah. Um, They will tolerate some shade, but they would really rather be in just full sun. Um, but they can tolerate some. You know, if they can get six to eight hours of sun, they'll still produce real well for you. But, you know, I've tried them in raised beds and in the ground, and I always get bigger ones in the ground than I have ever gotten in raised beds. You know, and it has good nutrients in the raised beds, but for some reason, I think it's that overwintering, and I think the raised bed. Um, heats up too fast, and then it we get that cold spell again, and it's just too much fluctuation for it. Okay, any other questions? You ever do a garlic braid? Um, if you're going to do a garlic braid, you do that on soft neck, not on a hard neck. Is there anywhere in town to buy them? You are just kind of wanting to try. You don't want to like order specialty ones. Um, Rain garden might. I haven't been down there lately, but a lot of times they have all that different kind of stuff. So you might try them. Um, a lot of times by the time you're pulling up, that scape has gotten too hard. And so it's a lot of times too hard to braid it. You know, but that, that's really the only reason. Yeah. Okay. Now, one day I was in Dawn's supermarket, right? And whoop, they had this, this garlic, and I'm looking at it, and there's no price at all. And I'm going, that is hard neck garlic, and it's purple, and I love purple garlic, right? And so I go up to the checker, and I said, and I, I had a whole bag full. Of, I probably had 15 garlic cloves, bulbs in there, right? And I said, there's no price on here. I just want to know how much these are. And so she brings it, she weighs it and tells me 76 cents. Oh and I thought, I should have went and got more of them. <laughs> Not usually. Usually you can just find soft neck. But that day in Dawn's, they had it. Now, I don't know if they still have any left. Um, then the other ones that they had, I got this at Dawn's and I got this at Walmart because I just wanted to be able to show you. They're both soft necks because you can feel them when you you can press down that that stem inside so but we'll just eat these or I'll make vodka with them. <laughs> I don't know um, but we use a lot of garlic and so it won't take long before we use those um, and I think they ran about just under four dollars for each one, which wasn't a bad price for soft neck garlic, I didn't think. But I was shocked at Dawn's. <laughs> and one of these is organic and one of them isn't. And so it just depends on what you want. I mean, you usually pay more um, online when you're buying your garlic. If it says organic, you're paying one price, and if it they don't say anything, you're you're paying less. So any other questions? Is that Don't forget that this will be recorded and where do you find that? It'll be on our YouTube channel. Okay. Um, if you just search uh, a lot of podcasts or gardeners, it should pop up.
Okay, and I guess they're doing a drawing for the little pumpkin. Yep, for the little pumpkin. Thank you, Andy. And make sure you come try some of the garlic honey. <laughs>